weaponry. Scallion. Oh yeah, this is this is the gun. Uh, type military rifle. Length. 869 millimeters. Can can we get that in like shorter in smaller measurements? Why is this in millimeters? In guns you tend to measure it in in smaller uh, I mean larger God units, I, I think anyway. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, barrel length. 432 millimeters. Clip size, five shots. Caliber, 7.92 millimeters. Yeah, that's about right for a carbine. Wait, um, 3,680 grams. Okay, you can just translate that straight into kilograms. Fuck off. Ugh, standard rifle. I know they measure that in kilograms. The standard rifle develop. I'm not reading that. You know what? All the other ones, I'm not reading that. A standard rifle developed by Gallia's only arms manufacturer, the National Arsenal, created during EW1. It was issued to Gallian soldiers and saw use in combat bef before the war's end. Oh, so it was one of the last ones. By minimizing ch changes made to the action of existing models, models uh, developers were able to save time in realizing their design while allowing for a wide range of uses throughout for, through further customization. Its name comes from its status as the first domestically designed rifle in the nation's history. Oh. ZM Car. Uh, that's the Imperial Rifle. Created by the Empire's top arms maker. Zechmeister. Zechmeister. ZM Corp. Uh, the rifle is one of the factors that enabled the Imperial Armies to sweep across Europa. Substantially lighter than conventional rifles, the ZM car greatly improved unit mobility and won the thanks of those forced to carry them on their march. Its distinctive axe shape earned it the nickname Francisca amongst its users. What? What in the world about this is axe shaped? Also, the sights don't look great. Um... How is this axe shaped? I don't understand. Okay, mags. That's our... Yeah, that's our SMG. Military machine gun. Submachine gun. 9mm. Okay. W1 saw a variety... Oh, we're just using guns from the last war, aren't we? Firearms to develop a, to suit a broad spectrum of needs. Among them, the machine gun stopping power made it exceptionally popular amongst arms makers, both within Gallia and abroad. The models of all shapes and sizes saw use in combat, the mag's machine gun was especially prized on the front lines for its portability. Excelling in rapid fire speed and ease, it exhibited unparalleled performance in the close quarters of trench and urban operations. Okay, ZMMP. ZMMP boasts a degree of refinement so high it was lauded as Zeichmeister's ultimate masterpiece. I'm probably butchering that. Uh, excelling in firepower, accuracy, and portability, it represents a p the pinnacle of everything required of a machine gun. I don't know, I looked at that thing's stats and it looked pretty goddamn miserable. Further sweetening the deal is the high concentration of pressed parts, easily manufactured at a low cost. Ah, see, there's where the real, the real thing that makes this amazing comes in. Why does the Empire use the same sights that I don't think would be very good on all the... Wait, is that a ring sight in a ring sight? No, okay. I thought there was a ring at the back and a ring at the front. Easily manufactured at a low cost. With these guns in hand, Imperial forces crossed Europa unchecked by the Federation and other nations. Lankar. No, it's the Lance. Gallia's most common anti-tank lance developed as a way to allow foot soldiers to combat tanks unassisted. An armor-penetrating warhead is loaded into the Lance's tip, then fired at the target, detonating on impact. I don't think you need this much for a shaped charge. Though its power and effectiveness are indisputable, its considerable, its considerable weight impedes the mobility of the user. The weapon draws its name from its use as a Lance-shaped anti-armor device. That is contrived. I would call that a LAN... I would call that a... Actually, I would still call that a LAN car, but I wouldn't abbreviate it... No, I would call it a LANAR. L-A... Lance... No, LANSHAR! Oh, LANSHAR sounds cool! L-A-S-H-A-N-A-R. LANSHAR! Yeah, that would be way cooler. VBPL. 
Uh, this is the Imperial one. Uh, this weapon could rightfully be called the grandfather of all anti-tank lances, developed by Von Bismarck. What? Under the f direction of founder Adolf Von Bismarck? <laughs> is a leader in explosives research. As the first major power to realize the tank's battle potential, the Empire was also active in developing the means to combating enemy tanks. The designation PL comes from the term Panzer Lance. That's, that's a, that's a pretty good, you know what, that's a pretty good name for that. GSR. Oh, that's their sniper rifle. G um, GSR sniper rifle has its origins as a rifle made for use on horseback, built with the, with all the know-how amassed during the Gallian S's development. Its defining feature is a variable, is a variable zoom sniper scope that, hmm... Guns built in the era of semi-automatic handgun. Built in the era of semi-automatic handguns, the fully manual bolt-action GSR was half obsolete by the time it hit the production lines. But its exceptional firing accuracy and brilliantly made safety saw its continuation saw it continue to see use until the very end of EW2. ZMSG. That's their sniper rifle. That's a car. That's a fucking car. Come on now. ZMSG was based on infantry gun carried by many of the Empire's soldiers during EW1. Particularly noted for its firing accuracy, the SG also featured a Rudolf Co. variable small arms scope. Lauded for its accuracy and uncommonly shock-resistant barrel, it first saw it in use with the Empire's mountain ranger units. Though the ZMSG's design allowed for a bayonet to be affixed under the muzzle, there are few instances of it being used during the Second European War. Because, you know, snipers. Type, uh, B-type grenade. A wooden handle extends from this simple can-type explosive, made from a powdered ragnite mix that emits a characteristic blue glow upon detonation. Why is there ragnite? The stuff that runs tanks, heals people, and is now explosives. What the fuck? It uses a friction-based fuse system in which the user first removes the safety cap at the handle's end, then pulls the internal ripcord to spark the fuse. Because the bomb detonates a few seconds after the fuse is ignited, requiring the user to swiftly throw it and then seek cover from the blast, it op its operation requires some degree of safety training. Yeah. VBWF. Similar to in basic construction to those used elsewhere, this friction fuse hand grenade is the official standard within the Imperial Army. Though the time delay until detonation can be adjusted via the dial or screw on the side of the device, most users were hesitant to deviate from the timing that had been drilled into them in training. Still, why don't we have that on the Gallian ones? Just saying. Edelweiss. This is in here? What? Okay. Um, arms... Themer... Is, is that just the name of the cannon? Oh, this is an 88! This is... This is goddamn... There's an 88 on this. Okay. Designed and constructed by Asar's late father, Themer, this tank's 360 rotating... 360 degree... Uh, rotating turret, fully automated loading system, and other innovations completely revolutionized tank technology. Built to be operated by two, well commands the guns and issues commands to Asar and control of both the wheel and the wireless radio. I, I, I think even tanks like this nowadays are generally rated for three? Because you're supposed to have a spotter and a gunner? Just saying? Despite its age, it was among the first to use angled plating and other emergent concepts, yielding high performance from an early test stage. Its high cost was all that precluded its mass production. Why aren't we pr mass producing it now? What, what the fuck? Ah! Hitting all the wrong buttons. Light tank. This is what we've been blowing up. Though originally developed before the outbreak of EW2, these tanks saw considerable use throughout the war. Taking the stage as tanks began to see a high use as high mobility unit, able to work in conjunction with troops on foot, this model came to define the epoch. By the beginning of EW2, however, they had begun to show signs of age and were outclassed by Federation counterparts in terms of frontal firepower. Yeah, because it's a Lee. It's a really dumb Lee. It's got a 45 cannon and an 85 mortar. That's that's not great. Uh, tab select. Uh, glossary? Principality of Gallia. Hey, now this this pr this promises to be interesting. Oh, it's just one page. Full of nature and rich in ragnite ore, Gallia's Gallia borders the Empire to the east and Federation to the to its on its western edge. God, this small Central European European mm, sorry nation is a constitutional monarchy ruled by House Rangrees, the hereditary sovereigns of Gallia, the first ruling ancestor of the House. Revered as the legendary hero of the ancient War of the Valkyr, 
built a castle on the site of what is now the capital city of R city Rangaris, establishing it as the seat of Gallian rule. Despite its size of only 38,567 square kilometers and population of just over 430,000, ah, it boasts a rich and unique culture. The official currency is the ducat. Hi, I was right. And it is characterized by policies of armed neutrality and universal conscription. So we're like kind of Switzerland. Gallia's history. Ah, see, this is what I want to know. The nation was formally born in the 3rd century, where Castle Rangris was built and rule over surrounding areas began. When the Empire invaded Gallia at the turn of the 19th century, the king renounced his crown, instead ruling over an autonomous region within the Empire as Archduke. This democratic movement swept through Europa. The Archduke harnessed the energy in Gallia to push for freedom from the Empire, resulting in the War of Gallian Independence. Stretched through in between multiple fronts, the Empire was unable to maintain its hold, and the small nation rose as the independent pr principality of Gallia, declaring neutrality and establishing a system of universal conscription. So, I may have this wrong, but I'm under the impression that this t conflict they're talking about here is actually European War I. Gallia actually started it. And then, yeah, that's they, they weren't a neutral nation that was just like, oh, why are you invading us? It's because they started the last war. Gallia's topography. The sea at its north and west, and thick forests shielding it to the south, Gallia is naturally fortified against invasion, historically allowing it to repel even significantly larger forces. Hilly plains cover 60% of the nation's land, and its mountain contains rich, mountains contain a rich store of ragnite ore, a valued source of energy. Large cities dot the flatland to the north, while the rest of it is largely occupied by lush farmland. Gallia enjoys a temperate oceanic climate with little variation in rain levels throughout the year, and the soil is highly fertile. Because growing conditions for livestock and grain are equally favorable, fa yeah, favorable, Gallia practices a mixed form of agriculture. Brule. A small town... This small town lies on the imperial border at the eastern edge of Gallia. Windmills stand atop the crest of many of the region's rolling hills, but few are as large as the so-called sister mills, built from an old castle tower in the heart of the town. Uh, because it radiates out from the mill, Brule is also known as Miller's Home. The town supposedly began as a hideout for royal guard soldiers who'd revolted against the king. Perhaps an echo of that, the town is ju of just under 8,000 nonetheless had an active town watch, and Brulers are famed for taking pride in guarding their homes themselves. Exports include dairy and bread made from locally grown wheat. The capital city of Rangaris. The capital city of Gallia, since its days as a monarchy, this ancient, it's still a monarchy technically, the ancient city has the longest history of any in Europa. This city takes its name from the ancient war hero who founded it and began to rule of the surrounding area, the ancestor of today's house Rangaris. Surrounded by castle walls stretching one kilometer in diameter, that's unusual. I don't think that'll do much good in modern warfare, I'll be honest. The entire city stands as a citadel and contains the seat of Gallia's politics, economy, and culture. Castle Rangaris, home to the Archduke, marks the iconic heart of the capital. It's not the heart, it's like one end, like a third of it or something. Anyway, uh, its magnificent tower has been linked to a unicorn's horn, giving rise to the national crest that bears the likeness of the mythical beast. Military headquarters. The Gallian army's central base stands amid a wooded area at the outskirts of the capital, known informally as, informally as Fort Amatrian, in honor of General Amatrian, who is responsible for reconstructing Gallia's military and establishing this facility during EW1. Within, it, within its walls lies the Army's command room, offices, training grounds, hangars for weapon storage and maintenance, and other military facilities. It also holds living quarters, a mess hall, infirmary, and relaxation lounge for the soldiers themselves. Even the R&D work on inventing new weaponry take, takes place in an off-base facility with mechanics and engineers hard at work there along around the clock. I feel like maybe you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket like that. I don't know. The Great Vassal Bridge. This massive iron drawbridge spans the Vassal River, which flows into Lake Graz near the walls of Castle Rangris. The bridge has its origins in the late medieval era, where it was built by two... With that, built with two towers at either bank as part of a ring of defensive installations around the capital. A 19th century renovation saw it made into a retractable bridge with a unique accordion fold design that allowed it to be opened by extending and retracting a single pair of cables. The city of Vassal... Single... What? I'm seeing this and that's not a single pair of cables. That's two pairs of cables. Um... The city of Vassal grew out from either side of the bridge, prosperous in, its, prosperous in its role as a transit gateway between the Gallian capital and the outside world due to its key position on both ground routes and a series of canals connecting it to the North Sea. Europa! Woo! 
A research-rich part of the largest landmass in the Northern Hemisphere, this land has inspired those with dreams of domination for millennia. In ancient times, the Valkyr managed to unite Europa under their rule, giving rise to a number of kingdoms. Subsequent divisions arose as influential leaders within each of these kingdoms chosen to splinter off to form new nations, and it was not long before the first campaigns of conquest began. By the 1800s, the balance of power lay split between the East European Imperial Alliance and the Atlantic Federation, with the small nations in their shadows left to weather the waves caused by the clash of these two behemoths. Yeah, um... So, here's the thing, another thing I should bring up. While the Atlantic Federation is roughly equivalent to the Entente, or allies, of the real world, the Eastern European, European Empire isn't actually Russia so much as it's Germany, and more importantly, like, a mix between Imperial Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. It's a bit confusing. Eastern European Imperial Alliance. A conglomerate of nations united under the rule of the Eastern European Emperor, commonly referred to as the Empire. The Industrial Revolution that occurred when Ragnite was discovered was a useful energy s as a useful energy source saw the nations of Eastern Europa, pioneers in machine technology, rise to power. Although tightly bound by a network of marriages amongst their royalty, these nations now joined hands in a formal international alliance. Yeah, see, it, it's Habsburgs. It even kind of looks, lo kind of looks like the Habsburg crest there. While not technically an autocracy, the empire, emperor enjoys limitless authority within the alliance. The empire retains customs and practices held over from medieval times, and its people are known to harbor conservative views, including a strong hatred of the darks and race. EC, European calendar. This calendar, used across Europa, has its origins in the Valkyr conquest of the continent. For this reason, it's known as the Valkyr. Valkyrian calendar. Each year is counted in relation to the year the Darkson people were subdued and Europa was unified as a continent. Years predating the unification are denoted BC or before conquest. Huh. First European War. Friction between Federation and Empire surrounding Ragnite resources escalated into a continent-wide EW War I. The Industrial Revolution of the 18th century led to skyrocketing demand for Ragnite, pitting the Europa's twin giants in a race for resources. When the Crown Prince of the Empire was assassinated at the start of the 20th century, I'm confused. Okay, so I guess Gallia didn't start the last war. It just started another war with the Empire previously. The Empire uh, tension spiraled into an all-out war. The Imperial forces en employed a corps of newly developed tanks. Hostilities soon became bogged down in fruitless trench warfare, and the two exhausted powers ultimately signed a ceasefire agreement. Uh, I get it. It's 20 years ceasefire. During the war, Gallia's military, led by General Belgen Gunther's tank corps, filled an Imperial invasion attempt. Why don't we have a tank corps? Why do we just have one tank? Second year open war. Beginning as Imperial incursions into Federated land, EW2 quickly engulfed the entire continent in what became the largest scale war in Europa's history. Though EW1 ended in stalemate, both powers had spent the intervening years stockpiling arms and preparing for the inevitable return of hostilities. After a short 20 year pause, the Empire began the invasion anew, taking three of the Federation's border republics in quick succession. Oh, that's not good. Uh, the Federation responded with a formal declaration of war. Come on, you can be faster than that. Uh, it wasn't long before the forces of both superpowers began to spill across the borders of, the, of other neighboring nations. Soon all of Europa was caught up in a war that dwarfed the, all those in memory. Yeah, it's World War II. Universal conscription. One of Gallia's national priests uh, states that all citizens are eligible to be drafted into service at times of war. An act is a way to enforce the po position of armed neutrality adopted after Gallia won its independence. The law prescribes a three-stage draft according to need and applies to men and women alike. Schools of every le each level offer mandatory military education, and all citizens are required to graduate from middle school, meaning all Gallians have basic training and combat skills. Universities double as officer training schools, and gra graduates are eligible for the rank of the lank rank of lieutenant upon enlistment. Gallian Army. A standard and s standing self-defense force serves to uphold Gallia's position of neutrality. As every system receives basic military training, most of Gallia is also guarded by independent watch groups, and defensive preparations are made on a town, neighborhood, and household level. In times of peace, Gallia's army is made up of 80,000 ground units, 10,000 marine units, and 2,000 military police units. That's a significant portion of their population! Jesus, that's like... What, an eighth? That's a lot to have mobilized! God! 
In addition to autonomous town watches found across the nation, when at war, and militia, a militia is drafted from the civilian public and assembled under the standing force, called the Gallian Army. Officers of the Gallian Army are assigned to lead militia regiments and battalions as necessary. Gallian National Arsenal. As the nation's only arms manufacturer, the National Arsenal develop, uh, develops both weapons and, and constructs all of Gallia's weapons. Seeing the production of arms as a part of national defense, leaders elected to end weapons importment, importation God, and founded a new domestic arsenal during EW1. This also helped keep weapons technology and plans from leaking to foes. Professor Thamer, creator of the tank that the war hero General Gunther operated, was a major player in the arsenal's initial staff, matched only by Bernard Brondel in skill. Brondel, who rose to lead the arsenal, is said to have amassed his considerable knowledge through a close friendship with a number of talented darks and engineers. Okay. Tanks! I, I know about tanks, but let's go ahead and read how they were important in this world. At the turn of the 20th century, a time when trench combat was the primary form of warfare, these armored vehicles were created to break across defensive lines. The design employs a raggling... God damn it. Fuel combustion engine... Just gasoline. Come on, people. In which energy is harnessed from the explosive ignition of liquid ragnite. Byproducts include a distinctive blue light, and extreme heat, requiring the addition of a radiator at the tank's rear to prevent overheating. Originally used to cross trenches as, a f as foot soldier support, economic and technological advances have seen tanks grow to fill a number of combat roles. After the empire, yeah, God. After the empire employed highly mobile attack tanks in EW1, all of Europa began to develop new vehicles, leading to the diverse array of models seen today. Ragnite. Yeah, can we explain why this stuff is bullshit? As Europa's primary energy source, this ore has become vital to daily existence. It's luminescence a characteristic blue hue when releasing the energy it contains. Mined primarily in mountainous regions, the raw ore is then refined for use in any number of applications. Though the ore's existence was known in ancient times, it was not until the Valkyr brought its refinery technology to Europa that its use began. Since the Industrial Revolution, it has become a vital ingredient in human civilization. A surging need for tank fuel and weaponry, weaponry derived from the ore has recently driven Europa's, to it, Europa's nations to expand their borders in a growing war for resources. Uses of Ragnite. Everything! Depending on the refinery method used, Ragnite ore can produce various forms of energy suited to a spectrum of needs. Refined into liquid raglan, it can fuel lamps or power vehicles, granting it a broad range of civilian uses. Its military applications include tank fuel, an incendiary agent for flamethrowers, which I hope we get later, an explosive payload and hand grenades, and countless others. Medical scientists all recently learned that the ore also acts as a painkiller. What the fuck is this shit? Developing a controlled, disinfectant, restorative agent known as Ragnite. New properties and applications for the ore continue to be discovered daily, and few doubt that this resource will only continue to grow in use and value. So it's bullshitium. I want some bullshitium. Lion's paw. It looks like a dandelion. Uh, a perennial plant found across Gallia, near and dear to the hearts of many as a sort of informal symbol of the nation. Okay, you know what? Fine. Distinguishing characteristics include small white star-shaped flowers and seed tufts often carried off by the wind, like tiny snowflakes. Its leaves spread close to the ground surface and cluster, with stalks bearing the plant's flower at their center. As an exceptionally hardy plant, they are known to thrive even under adverse conditioning conditions, weathering times of extreme hardship to bloom again the next year. Yeah. Goddamn weeds. Okay, so... On the grounds that I just read a whole ton of stuff, and this has actually gone on longer than I intended, I'm going to save here and call it quits and start again later.